The word malaria originally comes from the French, with mal meaning bad and aria relating to air. This is because malaria was originally thought to be caused by bad air. However, it's not actually the case. So what really is malaria and how is it transmitted from person to person? Well, malaria is directly caused by a tiny protozoa called plasmodium, which is a rather complicated life cycle. Now, out of the 200 different types of plasmodium, there are five which are normally if infect humans, with the others normally infecting other animals. In the case of humans, plasmodium enters the body in the form of sporozoites, a mobile form of the protozoa. This protozoa first enters the body in the bloodstream and makes its way via the circulatory system into the liver, where they invade the liver tissue and replicate. And whilst in the liver, some of the protozoa may remain dormant for years, making it difficult for the body's immune system to tackle them. And eventually, protozoa emerge as mirozoites, which a non-motile version may infect the red blood cells, which are plentiful in the liver. And inside the red blood cells, plasmodium can multiply rapidly until the cell bursts, scattering the plasmodium all around, enabling them to infect more and more red blood cells. At this point, the human body's immune system kicks in and tries to defeat the plasmodium. Whilst the plasmodium are in the liver or inside the red blood cells, the immune system has great difficulty locating and destroying the plasmodium. However, once they're out in the open, the immune system will try and cook the protozoa, resulting in high fevers, or try to remove the infected red blood cells, resulting in possibly anemia. In order to stop the red blood cells being removed by the spleen, the plasmodium can cause the outside of the red blood cells become very sticky, which result in blocked arteries and other blood vessels, leading to many other medical problems associated with malaria. And this ability to hide in the liver and inside red blood cells means that people who have contracted malaria can transmit the plasmodium to someone else through uh, blood transfusions or sharing of dirty needles or even a transplant. Now, there is a genetic condition in humans called sickle cell anemia, in which the dominant form of the condition radically alters the surface of the red blood cells, causing them to deform and result in severe circulatory problems. However, in the recessive form of this condition, the alterations on the surface of red blood cells are rather minor and don't cause the circulation issues. However, these changes do mean that plasmodium finds it more difficult to penetrate the red blood cells, and even when it does, resultant changes mean that the red blood cells are removed rapidly from circulation, normally before they're able to burst. Now, the result of these changes means that a person with a recessive form of sickle cell anemia is far less likely to die from malaria than someone without the genetic condition. This means in those areas where malaria is common, carrying the gene for sickle cell is actually a genetic advantage rather than normally a disadvantage. This just leaves us with a question of how does plasmodium enter the human bloodstream in the first place? This is where the mosquito comes in, or rather the female Anopheles mosquito comes in. So it's this particular mosquito that's responsible. Now the female mosquito needs to feed on blood in order to obtain nutrients for egg production. And whilst these particular mosquitoes will feed on animals such as birds and cattle, they really do prefer humans. If a mosquito then bites someone who's already had infected blood with malaria, they can then take up the plasmodium with the blood. Plasmodium will then develop within the mosquito and a few days later when these have matured inside mosquito and the mosquito takes another blood meal, this time they'll introduce the plasmodium into the new host. Now, since plasmodium are difficult to counter whilst inside the human body, most of the attempts at controlling malaria have been either attacking the Anopheles mosquito or by preventing the mosquito from actually being able to feed on humans itself. However, recent progress on malaria vaccines may represent another avenue of attack. These vaccines, vaccines step up the body's defences before the plasmodium enters the liver they're far from 100% effective. So even with widespread vaccination, there'll still be a substantial number of cases of malaria. We will need other steps to reduce the spread of malaria, especially 
climate warms and the geographic spread of mosquitoes will increase to other parts of the world that's not currently common.